Happy Halloween! Welcome to another It's a Mimic episode where we continue our conversation on Warlock Patrons in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. I'm Adam, and with me today are Kyle and Megan, and this episode is called Warlock Patrons, who you want on your team for the Papa Lock Contest. <laughs> <laughs> I was very proud of that one. Yeah. <laughs> In previous years, we've covered Great Old Ones, Archdevils, and Demon Lords. In this spooky episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, this panel of Dungeon Masters is going to look at three kinds of Warlock patrons that most people tend to overlook. The Celestial, the Undead, and the Fathomless. But unlike Great Old Ones and Fiends, these patrons tend not to be demigods, but rather creatures of immense power. Okay, before we get started, I gotta ask... Would you guys rather be an angel or a vampire or like a, I don't know, like like a creature from the Black Lagoon or something? Or like... Uh, let's roll. Yeah? Oh, right away. Eleven. That's loud. Eight. Five. Um, I mean, the answer's a vampire, right? One hundred percent. Like, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't, I don't need gills. No. And I am not going to be an angel. But breathing underwater does sound pretty dope. Yeah. But vampires don't breathe. They can just walk along the bottom of the fucking ocean. Oh. Um, Oh, thank you, Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that a thing? I, ret- I retract my... Angel. I would like to be an angel. <laughs> they sparkle like angels, though, in Twilight. I, I walk into people and be like, Halo. Halo. <laughs> I go for a creature from the Black Lagoon. Personally, I think there's too many rules to go along with vampires and angels. So, you know, you just kind of do your own thing. Also, sun. I like the sun. You like the sun? Yeah. Oh. You know, in small doses. I'd be the creature from the Blue Lagoon. Oh. Am I the only person that saw that movie? I think so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, right over my I, head. I am Brooke Shields is the point. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Someone out there understood what you <laughs> yeah, said. Yeah. Two other people got that joke. <laughs> Fuck. All right. So there are a couple of problems with, uh, with picking a patron who's... CR could be surpassed by a player character. Mm-hmm. At some point, the premise of Warlock starts to fall apart a little bit because you're siphoning a fraction of their power to gain, you know, essentially boons and gifts from them. So, just opening it up to the floor for a quick moment before we move into the actual patrons here. How do you guys go about the idea of um, of handling this when you're a dungeon master? When your player is suddenly CR 17 and is now surpassing the the vampire lord, right? How, how do we how do we handle that? I mean, I would rank the patron up with the player, right? Because well, they are in the book supposed to have a certain CR, you know, the the patron's getting the player to do all these tasks for it, right? So it could be getting access to uh, more magical artifacts, more knowledge, especially if you're doing like a lich or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I would keep making it stronger. I don't think you have to. I feel like I feel like if you're their patron, most of the time they're very elusive. You don't really see them. They don't really exist. They're just kind of like an entity that gives you abilities and powers and things like that. Like, you don't really have to allude to the fact that they're stronger than you are. They're where they are in their life because of... Like, great reasons and great cosmic power. So, like, I don't know. I just feel like you don't really have to know that you're stronger than your patron. I yeah. feel, I feel though, that a lot of your players will inherently know from a meta perspective. Yeah, yeah. But, like, don't metagame. <laughs> oh, okay. Was it just yeah. that easy? Thing? <laughs> just that fucking easy, guys. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Well, that's all for the tips for Dungeon Masters. <laughs> yeah. Hey, this has been your Halloween episode. We no longer have to have a podcast. Yeah. We've solved everybody's problems. <laughs> um, if this bothers you, turn off your brain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh, um, yeah honestly, uh, I think the idea of leveling up the patron is probably the right answer. Yeah. Um, I also like the idea of um, leveling it up slowly. So that your player character will eventually hit level 20 when this thing hits CR 20. Mm -hmm. Right? The other side of it too is that sure they're siphoning off a little bit and I'm level 17 now and the the monster is CR 16. What does that mean? Well, that means that a monster fights four to five people in the party that are level 16, Mm -hmm. which means that each one of those people, each one of the party members is 20 to 25% as powerful as the monster. Okay. So, even then, I think it's it's perfectly fine. Like a mummy lord or a fucking leviathan or whatever is going to overshadow, even if they hit that level, right? Mm-hmm. So 
just from the sheer amount of power. Fair enough. So uh, just really quickly to jump into the idea of warlocks, let's talk about the pacts again. There are four now because we got a special one from uh, Tasha's. Uh, the ones in the player's handbook are Pact of the Blade, which gives you a special shadowy blade thing. You can pull your weapon out of the ether and attack people with it. Um, Pact of the Chain, I'm really going super casual with these because we've got a lot to cover. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pact of the Chain gets you a familiar. You essentially get to find familiar spell, and your familiar is um, better than the average familiar yeah. because you get fiends and fey and shit. So mm-hmm. cute things. Yeah, uh, pack to the talisman gives you an uh, amulet, which lets you add a d4 to a failed ability check roll, and that's pretty much it. You can use that a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and that's one that most people don't think about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's moderately helpful, I guess. Yeah, yeah and you can give it to other people too. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, can you not? I thought you could. Yeah, you can give it to them to wear and they can use it. Oh, ability. yeah, yeah. You can give the talisman. Yeah. yeah. Um, whoever's wearing the talisman gets it, right? Um, and then there's back to the tome, uh, which gives you three cantrips. Woo. So that's okay. Yeah. That's, that's all right. Um, so other than that, uh, we're not going to jump into the bits and pieces, the ins and outs of uh, how warlocks work. Because all of that shit is covered in, in our other episodes. So you guys can go listen to that. What we're going to get into right now, though, is um, we've each prepped four theoretical patrons yeah. out of the Monster Manual or other works that are similar to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to roll dice and we're going to go through kind of a breakdown of, is this a good patron? Why it's a good patron? Does it not mix what we would do? Our inspirations, if a player came to the table and said, hey, my Fathomless is like, patron is going to be a mermaid. <laughs> Just a random mermaid. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, what do you do with that? Right. So, I've seen some weird shit come to my table over the years. So, let's, uh, let's jump into it. I've got the fathomless. Celestial for me. Undead. All right. So, let's, uh, let's roll and we'll go through them in whatever order we feel like. 16. Five again. And eight. All right. Megan, you're first with Undead. Yeah. Which one do you want to cover first? I'm going to start with Lich. All right. Because I feel like that one can commonly be used, and I've seen it be used before. Um, So just as a quick recap, if no one knows what a Lich is, I hope that everybody does, but you never know. Um, They're powerful wizards who basically choose to be undead as a means to gain immortality. Basically, their soul is trapped in a phylactery, traditionally an amulet or some kind of special box or object or what have you. Um... And that phylactery holds the lich's soul, basically, and holds it to the mortal plane, um, not allowing it to basically cross over, which is what grants them the immortality. Um, and basically, you know, weird, the, the weird thing I learned about them that I didn't really realize was that they have to be maintained. Mm-hmm. So they have to constantly be like, souls must be sacrificed to the phylactery. If it's not maintained, then they become a demi-lich. It was a weird thing for some reason. I never really put that together oh, yeah? beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, if a lich is killed, um, their body will regenerate uh, near the phy- phylactery after, like, 1d10 days due to their rejuvenation ability. So, obviously, a lich will want, of course, to keep the phylactery secret, keep it safe, like the whole fucking Harry Potter bullshit. Like, I was going to say Lord of the Rings, keep it secret, keep it safe, yeah. is literally the quote. Okay, well, you know, just blend in my nerd <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but yeah, they want to keep it sacred and keep it safe because it's really the only way to kill them. Um, so destroying a phylactery is not easy though. It is, it does require magical items and spells. I do feel as a DM, you can kind of get creative on how and means of destroying these items can be because there's a bunch of different rituals on how to destroy magical items. I feel like depending on the world you're playing and you can kind of get creative with it. Mm. Some fun things about liches is that they inherently, due to their immortal undead lives, like to collect magical items. So they like scrolls um, and like like gathering magic and knowledge and things like that, like all powerful wizards like to do. As beings, they are usually medium creatures that are evil aligned. They are they are intelligent, based uh, with limited strength. They are resistant to cold, lightning, and necrotic damage, and immune to poison, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, and non magical weapons. So no, that's standard legendary creature shit, right? Undead bullshit. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, they do have true sight for 120 feet and a passive perception of 19. They will see you coming. They're not stupid. Yep. Um, due to their intelligence, they do speak common up to five languages, which I think kind of checks out the fact that they probably gather and collect books and like to make themselves feel really smart. Yeah. Um, and of course, they're spellcasters. I won't go through like their spells that they get in like grave detail, but just as like kind of like a vision of what it looks like for these folks. Um, they get their mage hand, prestidigitation. Prestidigitation and Ray of Frost is cantrips. Um, they get Detect Magic, Magic Missile, Shield, Thunder Wave, Detect Thoughts, Invisibility, Animate Dead, obviously, Counterspell, Dispel Magic, Fireball, uh, Blight, Dimension Door, Cloud Kill, Scrying, Disintegrate, Globe of in- in- Invulnerability. Did I spell that right? I did. Great. Um, Finger of Death, Plane Shift, Dominate Monster, Power Word Stun, and Power Word Kill as their final. Yay! We love a good Power Word Kill. Yep. <laughs> But I, I, I digress, you kind of get the picture. They are not very kind beings who are self-centered and powerful. In fact, when when in their lair, they're a CR of 22. So... Yay! Yeah. Scary, scary things. So I feel Warlock would either choose a Lich to be their patron as they themselves are seeking this power. That's kind of how I see it in my brain. Mm-hmm. And it is bestowed upon them as a, like an agreement that they would keep the phylactery safe or something along those lines. Um, or flip it, and the Lich is building an army of warlocks that serve its kingdom. Yeah. That's something that I thought would be really cool. I like that. Yeah. Uh, which could basically lead to a big bad evil guy scenario. Like, I would love to be the patron of Acra. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> we've talked about Casey's, like, dragonborn wizard, who is now a Lich in our game many, many times. Yeah. Um, but I would love to be the patron of a black dragonborn Lich. Yeah. This sounds badass. <laughs> well... You are a descendant dragon monk? I am, yes. Well, let's we can multi-class. Hey yo. There you go. Um but when I'm thinking of the packs, this kind of screams packed the tome to me, since I feel if you are serving a lich or seeking lichdom, you are a magic user and bolstering your magic pro- like prowess is kind of like in your best interest. Mm-hmm. So having more cantrips and having more access to more magic, I think just kind of felt like that's what you're if that's what you're seeking, that would be the pact you would take. Yeah. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. I think it just fits. Um, I feel like your relationship would not necessarily be a positive one. Um, oh, could you imagine if the, you were packed to the talisman, the talisman ended up being its phylactery the whole time? Oh my god! Oh. Uh, I hate it, but I love it so yeah. much. Oh. I wonder if, like, it, like, if you would play it, again, don't metagame, but, like, if you would play it that you knew that it would die by, by a phylactery. I think that anybody who runs into a lich knows that phylacteries are an issue. Yeah. I like the fact that a phylactery can be literally anything. And I often like to make it part of the environment. It is <laughs> that column over there that is nondescript. It's the chandelier. Yeah. You will never attack the chandelier. For those. <laughs> it's that rock on the ground right there. Yeah. <laughs> Get it. Yeah. <laughs> Two of these eight pebbles. Enjoy. <laughs> Do I see the fly lactory? You well, you're gonna need a perception of thirty five. Yeah, investigate to find the the very small emblem yeah. carved on the bottom of it. It's very true, but no, I, th- I think liches would make a great patron. Mm-hmm. I think that they're just all powerful beings. They're self centered. They would be happy to bestow knowledge on other people to do their own bidding. Um, or keep their phylacteries safe, or just, there's a lot of things that you can utilize with a lich as a patron. Yeah. They are kind of warlocks themselves already, because yeah. they had to sell their soul, basically, to Orcus or other evil deities to get the secrets to become a lich in the first yeah. place. How high does the hierarchy go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who's bosses, who's bosses, who's boss? Yeah. <laughs> Which would be fun to find out. Like, if you're a patron of, like, let's say Acra, and then... Yeah. You find out that she actually, like, answers to somebody because her yeah. lichdom came from someone. Yeah. Right? yeah. She answers to a Sererak who answers to Vecna who answers yeah. to... Yeah. Right? Like, it goes all the way up the chain. Yeah, the CEO over here. Yeah, in the corner, yeah. Like. middle management <laughs> lich. <laughs> I'm just here to make sure you're wearing your uniform. <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh, I, I love them. I think that they are great. I am excited to get to play with the lich in this new campaign. Yeah? Yeah. Um, they are... Clearly the inspiration for the undead warlock, mm. above all of the other options, that they are the one that stand out. It's like, hey, this is clearly the warlock patron. Yeah, mm-hmm. very much so. Yeah, yeah, I like, um, I like them. Uh, and yeah, Pack to the Tome fits. Yeah. That's that's so really too. that's really good. But I like to your point. I like the talisman too, because then, like, again, that could be the phylactery, and you just didn't know it. Uh, I got a question. If you were to do Pact of the Chain, mm-hmm. 
So you're getting a familiar. Yeah. And, and it's not going to be a fiend or a pseudo dragon or a sprite because it doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. What do you do for a lich's? Like a rat. Like like a like a little <laughs> skeletal rat, a like a skeleton. zombie rat. Yeah, like a zombie. It would have to be an undead thing. Well, all of the other ones have intelligence and can speak. Yeah, and have like they're they're beefed up. They're not just animals. They're like beefy little. Like, would you just give a zombie? I would give a skeleton cat. A uh, homunculus probably would work better. Yeah, because it's oh. wizardy. Yeah, that's true. And it's kind of brainless, and they just do whatever you tell them to. Yeah. I for also for some reason I just see like a skeleton parrot as well. <laughs> that, that's really Pirates of the Caribbean, and I'm all over the little skeleton monkey. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be good too. I like the fact that it's gonna be a skeleton parrot though, so it can't fly. It, just... <laughs> <laughs> it tries, but it just makes clackety noises as yeah. the arms fly. <laughs> oh, oh. Drops to the ground, and then just shatters into bones. It just clicks after you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I was next, so let me jump into uh, the Kraken, mm. uh, who is clearly the one that the Fathomless is based on, um, and I will get into why here in a minute. For those of you that don't know what a Kraken is, I'm shocked. They are <laughs> gargantuan. I, I am shocked. <laughs> <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> um, they are gargantuan aquatic titans, and a titans... There are only like three or four creatures that get the Titan tag in 5th edition. It's a holdover from previous ones. Yeah. But it essentially means that they were made by the gods. And in fact, Krakens were the warriors of the gods, and they're designed to fight against mortals and mortal civilizations. Mm. And the mortals won, um, and so the Krakens uh, broke free and are terrorizing the world now. Mm. They are uh, giant squid things, but the art makes them radically different in every single picture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no consistency to what a kraken looks like besides the fact it's got a giant gaping maw of teeth. It has very intelligent looking eyes and it is absolutely massive with a shit ton of tentacles. Mm-hmm. Don't go counting the tentacles of a squid. It is not a colossal squid. It is a kraken. I like the one from Clash of the Titans. That's fun. But I like the one that we have as a mini. In, like, so much more. Yeah. It's got little fish fins on it. Like, it's it's ridiculous. How cute! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got huge strength and constitution. They're hyper-intelligent, um, which always surprises everybody. The Krakens are super intelligent. They are schemers. They understand abyssal, celestial, and infernal, as well as primordial, but not common, which is a load of fun for me. Uh, they have massive amounts of charisma and wisdom. They can control the weather. It's immune to lightning damage, and it can make creatures in its lair vulnerable to lightning damage. And it has the ability to, uh, it has an ability called lightning storm. So this is a creature of the storm, and therefore is fairly chaotic, which makes sense, because it is chaotic evil, but I think we really gotta lean into that yeah. aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it is immune to the frightened condition, which makes me wonder, can it feel fear? Is this a weakness? It's a, it is a creation of the gods, and it has been around since the beginning, like the dawn of mortality. Yeah. It's not meant to be fearful of anything, though, because it was a warrior for the gods, right? Right. So I don't think it can be frightened. Like, no. I don't think anything frightens this. It's not going to... It's not going to... I wonder if it's going to be so intense that it cannot conceive of its own death. Yeah. I, I don't know, because it's hyper-intelligent, so I think it would be able to recognize, oh, I'm not going to win this fight, I'm going to leave. But it's more of a logic decision than fear-based. Yeah, I, I just think that it's, um, there's a hubris to these guys as well. Yeah. yeah. But I agree, like, I feel like their survival would kick in, and that's mm. what would make them leave if they, like, it's, but they wouldn't be afraid of it. It would just be like, I need to live to fight another day kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also they're immune to being paralyzed. And it has freedom of movement, uh, and it does double damage to structures, which leads me to ask, can it be captured? In the lore, once the wars between gods and men ended, the Krakens broke free of their shackles and vowed never to be bound by anyone again. Mm. And it has a lot of mechanics that support that idea. Yeah. Um, this leads me to believe that the Fathomless Warlock was uh, with the Kraken uh, patron is going to lean into lightning spells, uh, be as chaotic as the seas, and try to impose her sheer force of will upon situations yeah. and not want to get locked down. Krakens are schemers, and they think big. They're deceptive and devious, but they are always willing to reward their followers by granting calm seas and stable weather. Being a patron is built right into their lore, and I think, but I may be wrong, this is the only one with actual hard-baked-in minions in the lore. 
Yeah. Um, like, Vampires have Vampire Spawn, but it doesn't quite count. No. But of all of the ones that we're talking about today, this is the one that has legitimate cultists following it around. Mm-hmm. At CR23, they know that they can overpower even the most ambitious and powerful mortals. And a Kraken has true sight and telepathy of 120 feet, so there's a precedence for magical communication and mental powers. And I was thinking about this. If you have telepathy out to 120 feet, and you're also a warlock bigness, you can grant powers to the creatures that are far beyond 120 feet. Is like visiting people through their dreams and stuff just like a, a more convoluted and a weaker version of telepathy? Hey man, dreams are powerful. Right, but like, if I can if I can actually put words and images in your head at 120 feet, and then I have to do it only while you're asleep and relaxed from a distance, and it's largely metaphorical, and mm-hmm. so it's... It's obscured by the cloudiness of the mind and whatnot. Is it a, you know how like a radio signal gets weaker and kind of gets gets static and shit the further out you go? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that what, what dreams and warlock patron communication is? It seems to be that way. Like the closer yeah. you get, the more powerful the shit becomes? Yeah. Well, I'm also imagining if you're asleep, your mental barriers are weakened too, right? So yeah. you're being able to access that person's brain from much further away. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, they're in their, what is, what is the word I'm trying to think of? When you're sleeping, you are vulnerable. Yes. Right? So it's kind of like, it's like that creep factor of like, I'm coming for you when you're in your most vulnerable state. Yeah. yeah. And it, like, there are lots of monsters that do that. Yeah. Hags and a lot of demons and stuff. So um, I assume that the dreams and the communications that, that you're getting, the visions from this warlike patron are like tentacles groping underwater for like a tombstone or a a target, um, objects getting crushed by invisible forces, swirling underwater bubbles in the darkness. I was thinking a big plot hook for these guys would be someone actually captured the Kraken. Yeah. And they, which it should not fucking be able to do. Yeah. Right? Uh, and now this Kraken, who is desperate to get free, is reaching out and funneling power to someone to come rescue me. Mm-hmm. Mm, interesting. So that's that's my plot point at the end of the, at the, end of the campaign. Huh. So. Okay. Um, like these guys also have Kraken priests that are built into them, um, which are CR5, uh, they're typically chaotic evil, and they've got a higher wisdom than they do charisma or intelligence. Um, with the low charisma and low intelligence, that makes sense for most cultists. Mm-hmm. The Kraken priests do thunder damage and thunderous touch and thunder bolt, so while the Kraken does lightning, the, the followers do thunder. Something to think about for the warlocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also get a, um an ability called Voice of the Kraken, which lets the Kraken's true voice be manifested through the Kraken Priest, causing people in a 300-foot radius to become frightened, which is really fun and neat, and I like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, the Krakens don't speak common, so this humanoid just opens their mouth and, like, bubbling moist noises come... Moist noises. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Squelching. (laughs) (laughs) I think squelching is worse than moist. I I hate the word squelch. (laughs) Noted. (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, Kraken Priest also has a handful of spells, including Command, Create or Destroy Water, Control Water, Darkness, Water Breathing, Water Walk, Everd's Black Tentacles. And they used to have Call Lightning and Volos, but that's been removed now in Monsters of the Multiverse. Mm-hmm. For the most part, this seems to be the obvious inspiration for the Fathomless Patron, um, based on the theme and, and the Patron um, spell list, which is Create or Destroy Water, Thunder Wave, Gust of Wind, Silence. Lightning Bolt, Sleet Storm, Control Water, Control Water, not Control Walther, um, Summon Elemental, Bigby's Hand, and Cone of Cold. Um, Bigby's Hand, however, appears like a tentacle for these guys, Mm -hmm. so I like that. Uh, When a Warlock gets powerful enough to be able to challenge the Kraken, I think the Kraken would send out its cultists and minions to take out the Warlock. Mm -hmm. I think the more powerful you become, your patron is starting to sabotage you. Mm Mm-hmm. When you hit tier four, you now have to fight a bunch of fucking minions that are out to sabotage, right? Yeah. So I would really like this for a post, um, like, module plot hook. Like, you get up to level 13 or 14 in the book, and then where do you go from here? The Kraken's out to get you. You got powerful. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, the warlock's gone from tool to nuisance. It's time to kill them before they become a proper threat, right? Yeah. Uh, and this, again, is packed to the tome for yeah. me. Like, it's spells. It is just sheer magical power. Yeah. Um, and I would flavor it all to be water, cold, tentacle grossness. Okay. Moist, squelching grossness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys like the Kraken? Love me a Kraken. Yeah, it's great. I also think it's hilarious that all the cult followers have thunder, because thunder always follows lightning. Mm. 
It's very Zeus Thor thing going yeah. on here. No, I, I like it thematically. The, the thunder follows the lightning. You're like, that's my that's my one for today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kyle's going We're home. All done. <laughs> All right, what do you have? You have... Uh, I have the Empyrean. Empyrean? Empyrean. Empyrean, Empyrean yeah. Uh, so they are the children of deities, uh, beings of statuesque beauty, confident and prone to childlike tantrums. They're also one of the only other titans. Yes, they are. Mm. Um, they are mostly good, mostly lawful good, uh, but they can be corrupted by the lower planes or cursed by evil deities and become evil. Um, they are essentially immortal. If they do die on the material plane, they go back to their home plane, and then their parents, whatever deity birthed them, can choose to give them life again. Um, but rarely they don't get reborn. I'm guessing if they fall or something like that. Um, their emotions can shape the natural world around them. Uh, so if they're in a bad mood, plants will die behind them. The sky will cry salty tears and... Animals will die, and then if they're feeling good, you know, bright sunshine follows them wherever they go, flowers bloom, and animals are frolicky and kind of thing. Man, I hope it never becomes aroused. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be that kind of episode, huh? Talk about someone's flower. <laughs> <laughs> So they also carry a giant maul around, which makes me think of Bam Bam from the Flintstones. Yeah. You know, like incredibly strong, prone to outbursts, and carries a hammer. Uh, <laughs> so their spells, I don't think they really line up. Honestly, none of the Celestials that I got today, spells list actually like lines up with what you get. Because um, most of the Celestial Warlocks spells are... Uh, healing and radiant damage. But this guy has, you know, Greater Restoration, which is a healing spell, but then Pass Without a Trace, Water Breathing, Water Walk. These guys are really environmental. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they do have Firestorm, which is, I guess would be the closest, but... Would you think that a lot of that healing and radiant damage would be its will? Like, it's very childlike, right? Yeah. It's not that it's stupid, it's just very emotional. Yeah. So it would be like, oh, you got hurt, no, feel better. Yeah. And then it just, and then you do. Like, here's your magic. Like, here's your healing, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, oh no, I don't like him. Hurt him more. Pff, yeah. Radiance, right? Like, I, I think that's how I'd flavor it. Mm -hmm. To just be more on a whim and reactionary. Yeah. Well, they do carry angelic weapons, which means every time they hit something, they deal radiant damage with that on top of it. Yeah. Um, so I guess they're just giving your warlock the chance to do that. Sure. Um, so. So, they can fly, swim, and walk up to 50 feet. Um, they got strong spellcasting uh, with saving throw of DC 23, a plus 15 to hit. They have legendary resistances, magic resistance. Their weapon attacks count as magical. For attacks, they have a maul attack that can also stun. A ranged bolt attack that can deal acid, cold, fire, force, lightning, thunder, or radiant damage, depending on what they want to do. Cool. Yeah, which is pretty awesome. Uh, they also have legendary actions where they can bolster, uh, so they make non-hostile creatures immune to being charmed or frightened, and also give them advantage on saving throws and ability checks until the Empyrean's next turn. Uh, they also have a trembling strike, so they can knock every creature within 60 feet of them by slamming their maul against the ground, and then they can also just make an extra attack as well for their legendary actions. So they have a CR of 23. Um, why would this creature want to interact with a mortal? On a whim? I yeah. Right? For fun. It would be like, you're like, oh, you're going to follow me. How exciting. How good for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was also thinking about them trying to establish themselves as their own gods. So they're too new, not powerful enough, not uh, renowned enough to actually have followers and priests, clerics, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So they're hiring you to go around and spread the good word about them, right? Yeah. Doing good deeds on their behalf. My God, could you imagine, like, this thing is your patron because the gods, like, babysit this fucker? Yeah. yeah. Take care of him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's so cute, though. <laughs> How frustrating would that be, though? That you're just like, you're an all powerful warlock, but you're getting your magical powers or something, you're babysitting. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh, I like the other side of it, too, where like you run across it at level one and it just thinks you're pretty. Yeah. You have some power 
And then he fucks off somewhere else, and you just keep getting more and more powerful. Like, stop it. Stop it. That's stop it. Slices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when? When? <laughs> say, say when. <laughs> I also imagine these guys being, like, super bored and competitive with each other. Yeah. So they go around collecting warlocks, trying to outdo other Imperians. Yeah. Just... just I, I have a I have a bigger posse than you do. Yeah, <laughs> posse. Fuck Megan. What? <laughs> <laughs> person do you think I am? Oh, do you, do you want me to answer that on mic? <laughs> <laughs> well, I will fight you. <laughs> You'll win too. Not me. No, I won't. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In terms of how they would influence them, I don't think Celestials have a whole lot of subtlety to them. No. Right? Like, you're going to find yourself transported to the upper planes, and you're walking along with clouds, and then there's just, like, a booming voice just yelling at you what to do. Mm-hmm. And that's like, okay, go do it, and then leave. Right? Yeah. Just fuck off back. Just fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Thou shalt fuck off! <laughs> In terms of what they would want out of this, I think this is going to be the same for all of the Celestial Patrons. Right, a lot of times it's going to depend on, you know, are they in good standing with yeah. whoever their deity is? Right, are they trying to claw their way back up from being fallen so they're giving you power to try to get back in the good graces of somebody else? Bolster themselves, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then just along the lines of protecting the innocent, killing fiends, and punishing their enemies, kind of thing. Yeah, That's- I I really like these guys. I like the idea that they can be fallen, mm-hmm. right? Because they're they're emotional, right? So they're going to fuck up. Yeah. And so the idea that they fall, and then you are the warlock. But I would I would double down on that and be a fallen ASMR. Okay. Right. So yeah. you have been chosen because you're an ASMR. Um, like they have they have chosen you specifically because you're moderately angelic as well. But the reason you're fallen is not anything you did, because you're getting power from this guy. Yeah. So their redemption arc is also your redemption arc. Interesting. Mm. So, I mean, Empyreans can father ASMRs as well. Oh my gosh. They're just so, going to birth their own army. Yeah. I'm sorry, how big are these guys? Uh, they're huge. No, large. Huge. They're huge. Yeah. ASMRs are half human. And then half celestial. And so apparently these... Ouch. <laughs> yeah, just... that, that's a big baby. Just ouch. Yeah, I think uh, Empyreans and Solars can make these Mars and planetars. Jesus. That's... That's... The, wow. Just blew out of his brain. <laughs> Do you like them? Yeah, they're they're pretty neat. I like how they're not... Locked into just being like straight good, like the rest of the Celestials. Yeah, the the yeah. others feel almost lawful stupid. Right? Yeah, like, I, I think honestly, this is probably one of the most likely to actually have warlocks mm-hmm. because Solars and Planetars don't really make sense for them. Wouldn't really have an interest in mortal bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Do you uh, what uh, what pact would you give this guy? Blade. Blade. Yeah. Pact of the blade. Yeah. All right. Blade. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. sense. Sure. Yeah. He carries around a giant maul and. Uses yeah, and Pact of the Blade doesn't have to be a sword. It can yeah. be, a, like, you can pull your Great Maul out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wave it around. Okay, Adam. Settle what? it down. What? <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk about the Nightwalker. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you're going to talk about yourself? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shots fired. Kyle. We were becoming friends, and I'm, I'm revoking that. <laughs> hey, you can fire him back. <laughs> anyway, so I love a good Nightwalker. <laughs> Jesus, Megan. <laughs> and I don't think that they scream patron, but, like, there's a way to make it work in my mind. Mm, yeah. So, if, for those who don't know, they are basically manifested from a place called the Negative Plane, which is a place of death and dying. Sounds really great. Sounds like a wonderful place to be. <laughs> and even though all things uh, living go there, go there to die, some folks survive crossing over, but then are then replaced by a Nightwalker in the mortal realm. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, you basically cross over into, like, if you... I don't know why you would want to. That's something that I was trying to figure out why you would want to cross over and survive. Mm-hmm. The negative plane is not a, it's not, it's not a real place. No. It's just swirling energy of anti-life, right? Yeah. That's where I, that's where my lich's phylactery is going to go. Yeah. 
right? Like I'm, the lich will will banish it to the negative plane so that no one's going to go get to it, right? Yeah. Like it's you a, die before you get there. Yeah, or right. open up a, a pocket dimension off of the negative plane or something, right? Like there are plot reasons yeah. to go, but... Doesn't the phylactery need to stay on the mortal plane because it is anchoring the lich to the mortal plane? So if you send it to the negative energy plane, wouldn't it... The rules for phylacteries have changed from... From edition to edition, and okay. are never clearly stated. You do whatever you want. Yeah, it's so. Here's a plot hook. Figure it out. So that's that's what fifth edition gives us. Okay, we love that for us. But yeah, so if you were to survive crossing over, you are then replaced by a Nightwalker in the mortal realm, and the only way to come back is to lure the Nightwalker back to the negative plane. So if you kill a Nightwalker, that traps a person over there. Hundred percent. Cool. So if, if the Nightwalker dies, then whoever crossed over is there forever. Can never come back. Cool. So Nightwalkers have no reason to make friends with living things, as it is born to sap the life force out of everything that it comes across. So I can't imagine that, like, the Nightwalker itself would be your patron. I would almost mm-hmm. say that the person that crossed over would be your patron, and they have now tasked you with luring the Nightwalker back. That's a cool Ooh, plot. Oh, yeah. I, like I that. was going to be like, you're, you're siphoning energy off of it against its will, but I like yours better. Yeah. Mm. But um, just describe what they are. They're huge, undead, chaotic, evil, frightening things that are CR of 20. They are not small. They're huge, scary, scary monster looking the, things. They're looking the Imperium yeah. in the eye. Yeah. Very, very scary. Um, but not only do they walk the earth, but they also have a fly speed. Like, what the actual <laughs> fuck? <laughs> Yay! Yay! Um, I honestly, I feel like that just because they're like ethereal. Like, they just kind yeah. of like float around in my mind. They don't necessarily yeah. walk on the ground. They're I like the idea of their toes just dragging. Gliding. Yeah, yeah, across the ground, killing everything. At the, all the grass turns brown. Yeah. <laughs> well, their body is basically made out of smoke that's just been condensed. Yeah. So it's like wispy blackness flowing you, off them wherever they're going. Yeah, if you look at the art for these, they're fucking frightening. Yeah. And I yeah. love that about them. Um, but the other scary thing is that they're resistant, uh, their resistances and their immunities. So they're resistant to acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical items. Um, and then they are immune to necrotic and being poisoned. They are also immune to being exhausted, frightened, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, um, or being restrained. So good luck luring this thing away, right? Like, right. You, you've gotta, you've really gotta give it something it wants. Yeah. It's just a bag of kitty treats. Shake up, shake that cat <laughs> Wow, what would the thing be? You'd have to work it in like this is the most. This is the thing that's most full of life. Yeah, right. Because yeah. you would lure it with life because it would want it. Just a bag full of holly fans. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the difficult part about that to get close to it is that it has what's called an annihilating aura, which is anyone starting within thirty feet of a Nightwalker must succeed on a DC twenty one con save or take four D six necrotic damage. And then the Nightwalker has advantage on attack rolls against you. I love auras. This is a CR yeah. twenty creature. Like it th- is, this, yeah. is, this is what it's for. Yeah, and because they are considered life eaters, um, if it reduces a character to zero hit points, they are now dead and cannot be revived other than with a wish. You're dead. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So they are again like I, they're so fucking frightening. It's very difficult to find a reason as to why a Nightwalker itself would want you as a patron or give you boons. Mm -hmm. Um, This is why I feel like it's going to be the person that's trying to come back. Uh, Or you are trying to seek the negative plane and you think that latching yourself to a Nightwalker is going to give you access to that plane, right? And maybe that's your way of crossing over. Okay. Or like your parent ended up getting sucked into into the negative plane 20 years ago. And now you're trying to get them back. Yeah. And so you have accidentally, through a ritual, bound yourself to this creature? Yeah. There's some fun that could be had with this. Sounds a lot like Tron. Yeah. Yeah, like, I guess, except there weren't, like, like 15 foot tall evil shadow monsters walking around in the world. Actually, we don't know that. We only saw the yeah. computer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, but, like, to go back to your point about how, like, it could be your parent that got sucked into the plane, a Nightwalker came out, and now you are protecting the Nightwalker because you don't want people to kill it because you want your parent to come back. Oh. There you go. That's a great plot. Yeah. Like, you can't, you can't lure it, so you're going to keep it alive, so it keeps your parents alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are going to be chaotic. No, you're going to be lawful neutral. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, Fun. What, a, what a sad story that would be. And then, oh, what an emotional moment when, like, your party rocks up and, like, kills the Nightwalker. Yeah. And then it's like, no! <laughs> Mommy! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like them. Again, 
again, it didn't screen patron right away, but when you started really thinking about it, there's a couple of things you can yeah. throw in there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do the spells line up? Um with the with the warlock patron spells? Uh I mean most of most of the undead uh warlock spells are necrotic damage. Yeah. And I can imagine. I can't remember what the other half of them are. But yeah, this thing deals a bunch of necrotic damage. So I feel like this one would fit. Yeah. yeah. The abilities line up pretty well. Bane, False Life, Blindness, Deafness, Phantasmal Force, Phantom Steed, Speak with Dead, Death Ward, Greater Invisibility, Anti-Life Shell, and Cloud Kill. Yeah, man, there's a lot of death in there. No. I feel like it fits. 100%. But I would do um, uh, Pact to the Talisman with this one. Yeah. Because I feel like you would want to bolster your abilities and your attacks to either, depending on what direction you're going, because if you're going to try and protect it, you would want to have the extra abilities to keep you sane. Well, this is only for, for when you even. when you fail ability checks. Yeah. Right? So it just this is going to make you more effective. Um, I feel like this is really good to multi-class with Rogue. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Or Bard. You know, one of the one of the skill monkeys, like, mm-hmm. uh, like a ranger. So. Yeah. Um, ooh, like a Horizon Walker ranger or a Gloomstalker ranger with these guys. <laughs> Yeah, I can see it. That's fun. Aggressive. Mm. Uh, my next one is the Dragon Turtle. There's not a whole lot of fathomless water aquatic creatures in 5th edition that are, like, big and scary. They're all CR2. We right? fought a Dragon Turtle in our campaign, didn't we? Yeah, you guys fought a Dragon Turtle. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you guys fought a juvenile Dragon Turtle. You didn't fight a full yeah, one. Almost died. Yes. <laughs> um, dragon Turtles, um, I'm not going to talk about the ancient one that's in Fizzbands because... Not everyone has access to the Fizzbands books. I am going to talk about the the lore from Fizzbands, but not necessarily the stat block. Uh, the general rules, I'm going to talk about the adult one that's in the Monster Manual. It's the same. The ancient one gets better numbers. That's how it works. So, mm. Dragon turtles are giant turtles with a big steam breath. They're technically dragons. They're still intelligent. They still have all of the things that a dragon has, except they're neutral. And they're self-serving. Yeah. Um, they're gargantuan. And they're technically a dragon, but I mean, it's not like there's an aquatic sub creature type, right? So, yeah. mm-hmm. so I'm going to count this. They're neutral, uh, but that doesn't mean stupid or inactive or without wants. They're still dragons. They're concerned with self interest, which doesn't necessarily mean selfish, but they are definitely known to impose their will upon a region for specific personal gains, like treasure or influence. Or just comfort. This sits comfortably at a CR-17 with huge strength and constitution and moderate mental stats. It's not a tyrant or a demigod as so much as a force of nature that can be bribed or swayed or convinced. Powers will be lent to warlocks for a specific worldly purpose and not a grand scheme. With the mental stats that they have, it's safe to say that they will have similar motivations and ambitions to a mortal, unlike most of the other creatures we're talking about today. They speak Aquan, which is an offshoot of Primordial, so I feel like it's a language barrier, but they could figure out the other Primordials. Mm -hmm. Um, Draconic, and not common, again. I love that for the Fathomless, that they do not understand what's being told to them. Yeah. They're just living their life. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All of a sudden, wet squelching noises in the back of their head, and they go, (laughs) go, oh God, I am suddenly compelled to go east. But God God damn. What a terrible (laughs) sound. (laughs) Uh, the most notable features about them, beside their size, is their huge AC and hit points, and their steam breath, which does fire damage due to the heat it produces, uh, not due to any flames. Heading over to Fizzbands for some further flavor inspirations, we see that they do get access to some spells, including Fog Cloud, Control Weather, and Control Water. Uh, this lines up moderately well with what the Warlock gets from their subclass, although Bigby's hand is in the form of a tentacle, so it might be better flavor to be, like, Kelp? Um, or something to like, like a flipper. flipper, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> to, to, to mimic, well, they have a thing called entangling kelp as a lair action, so yeah. okay. And uh, I'd be looking at fire spells, uh, to replace the thunder wave and lightning. Um, and but of course, I'd reskin them to be steam and not actual fire, not yeah. flame. Um, dragon turtles are going to look for the mortal most likely to complete their mission, so they're going to lean into non chaotic non-righteous mortals. Uh, they want people that are down to earth that will understand where they're coming from. Yeah. Communication won't necessarily be in dreams, but instead through weather and tides and environmental communication. Think omens and portents. Uh, gifts might wash up on the shores for the warlock. If you're walking along the beach, 
a gift washes ashore from mm. your patron. He's gift. <laughs> Message in bottle. <Yeah. laughs> um, geysers will be places to stop and try to commune with the patron. Offerings will be of gems and riches, not sacrifices or acts of fealty. Mm -hmm. uh, dragon turtles are more likely to have earthly goals and quests and might even send a mysterious aquatic messenger at night uh, that they have bent to their will, like uh, coastal humanoids, Sahuigan, Kuatoa, or Lokatha. Um, I'd stay away from turtles, mostly to keep their interactions feeling mythical and otherworldly, right? Yeah. Getting weird sea creatures and not turtle person. Yeah. <laughs> um, when the warlock gets powerful enough to be able to challenge the dragon turtle, uh, I think it would just offer more incentives and better rewards, because now it has a partner. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be a competition here. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking Pact of the Chain. Okay. Well, a little familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Just because there's no... Um, how, how do I put this into words? The dragon turtle is more about accomplishing things and having a... In my head, the... Familiar for a warlock is also working for the patron. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right, as opposed to your regular familiar. It's part so. of the package. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The package. The package. <laughs> or that's how the patron communicates with you as a person. Yeah, right? yeah it like could a, be. It's like a conduit of yeah. some kind, yeah. Um, and so I was thinking, like, I would literally just give you a small baby turtle. Oh. Um, and it doesn't need to be submerged. It can flip her around. Five foot movement speed. And, ah. And it just hides in its shell. <laughs> right? I love but, it so much. But, like, it's this cute little thing, but it would still get a moderate, like, like steam breath. All yeah. of the other patrons, uh, or all the other um, familiars for a Pact of the Chain Warlock, they all have fucky shit they can do. They can fly, they can turn invisible, they can yeah. whatever, right? So you gotta give the Warlock familiar, if you're gonna change it, you gotta give them more than just an animal. It's gotta be more impressive than that. Yeah. So. Flying turtle. Ooh, neat. I like that. It just floats around. Just with the little flippers. Yeah, it swims in the air. Yeah, like it's, it's it swims in the air. Yeah, and it, it snaps. It, has, it does 1d4 bite damage with its little beak. <laughs> she feisty. <laughs> no, I think it's cute. I like it a lot. Very thematic. Uh, so the next one on my list is Solars. Uh, so Solars are planetars who have been raised through great service um, to act as the right hands of deities and are below only celestial paragons in terms of power for the celestials. We're in like literal angel territory now, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. The Empyrean wasn't, but this is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, kind Depending on kinda, how you I mean, yeah, Empyreans yeah. are like, they're not gods, but they're children of the gods, so they're kind of... They're demigods. Yeah. They're like, they're... There's a legitimate difference between an angel and a demigod. Like, there are a lot of celestials that are straight up not angels, like unicorns and, yeah. and chirons and whatnot. So, so the uh, coattles are another one. Just like there are, there are some things out there, and I think the Empyrean is not necessarily an angel so much as a Hercules. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking, right? With their insane strength. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, onto Solar. Sorry. Yeah. Derailed. Yeah, uh, so they are the true embodiment. <laughs> took me a second to uh, like just start the cogs up again. Uh, it's, it's a steam engine. Yeah. That got you <laughs> Shoveling coal. <laughs> Give me a flying turtle. Uh, so they are the true embodiment of their gods' virtues. Living and breathing them within every act. They basically only do anything if it's at the direct behest of their deity. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that they make very good warlock patrons because they wouldn't, they don't really have any sort of individual thought or individual actions. Unless, yeah, I've been commanded to siphon some of my power off to you. Yeah. The only reason I can think of that it would get uh, a warlock is basically it's been told it can't intervene. It's been told it can't intervene in a certain scenario, right? Yeah. And so they like their deity and a fiend has made a pact like, you know, we're not going to do anything here. We're just going to let the mortals figure it themselves out. But there's no rule saying, you know, we can't hire someone to do our work for the us. The devils are totally getting cultists and shit and the angels are like, "Well, what do I get?" Fuck, yeah. right? So, and then there's one that has a slight inspiration that like walked too close to a muse once. Yeah. It was like we we could get mortals too. I mean, don't tell dad, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have the means, we have the powers, we can do this. Yeah. yeah. Or the other one I was thinking of is that basically 
it failed in a task and it doesn't want their deity to know. So it's kind of like <laughs> sneaky sneak. Yeah. <laughs> don't tell them. Uh, they're outsourcing <laughs> they're outsourcing their work so they don't get caught. <laughs> Oh, the other thing that would be really cool, too, is if they're using... Ah, this is devious. If they're using your party as the decoy. Okay, yeah. All right, here, have some power. Go off. Fight this guy. You're destined to lose, but that's okay because my angels are going to come in the back door and fuck it up, right? So, yeah. So, here you go. Here's your here's your little bit. It's for the greater good. <laughs> it's not really a lawful good, though. Because, I mean, most of these guys are lawful good. If you're wiping out uh, an army of demons or devils... Mm -hmm. Means justify the end, right? Yeah, still good. I don't. I, I kind of always thought that was neutral. I think that that technically speaking, it is. I think this is that that solo. It's a little off the fucking rails. Oh, like God. just just peeking around the corner of neutral. <laughs> they maybe shouldn't have gotten that raise. <laughs> <laughs> We've all known that manager that shouldn't have been. Yeah. Hey man, I've been that manager. <laughs> <laughs> Fake it till you make it, my mm -hmm. guy. <laughs> So for stats, they have 50 feet of walking speed, 150 foot fly speed. Uh, they're resistant to non-magical attacks, immune to necrotic and poison damage, and to being charmed, exhausted, frightened, or poisoned. Uh, they have true sight and telepathy up to 120 feet, like the Kraken. Uh, they have angelical weapons, so they count as magical and deal 68 radiant damage on a hit. Uh, they have a divine awareness, so they cannot be lied to. They can hear it. Uh, they have innate spell casting. They're... Uh, the spells don't really line up, but I mean, the abilities do. I think that's where a well, lot of the crossover with it is. The radiant damage makes sense, but the healy stuff, not so much. These guys are warriors, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, they can also... They do uh, have some heals. Yeah, stuff, they have a but... healing touch kind of thing, which will give you healing, and then will also take away um, any sort of curse, disease, poison, blindness, or deafness as well. Mm -hmm. Um, they have magical resistance as well, giving them advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. Uh, they have a multi-attack where they can make two greatsword attacks. Um, they also just have a greatsword that can hover around them, so they can just release it, and then as a bonus action, they can send it up to 50 feet. It's like a spiritual weapon. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and then they also have a slaying longbow, which is insane. This longbow, on top of dealing a bunch of damage, radiant and piercing, uh, if that creature is under 100 hit points, yeah. it has to pass a DC 15 con save or just die immediately. Uh, so then there's the healing touch. Uh, and then they also have legendary actions. So they can teleport up to 120 feet uh, to a point they can see. They also have searing burst, which basically just means they <clears throat> explode with radiant energy. Yeah. Uh, and can... Sorry, what does that sound like again? <clears throat> Okay, that's what I thought. He's able to repeat that. That was really well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should spend hours practicing. Yeah. So I'm ready for this episode. Uh, so it bursts out in a 10-foot radius um, and then deals a bunch of fire, radiant damage on a failed save, and then half as much damage on a success. Mm -hmm. And then blinding gaze. So if they can look at a teacher, uh, creature. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's a lot of sequins. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the head tilt. I was like, what's in there? I want to know. <laughs> Anyways, talk to me more about blinding gaze. <laughs> now I'm just imagining them like throwing a bunch of glitter on somebody. <laughs> the, the what's verbal, the sound effect for the, that? The verbal component is fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> Love and hate it. Uh, so, forcing a creature to make a con save, and if they fail, they are blinded until they have a remove curse or lesser restoration cast on them. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They have a CR of 21, and I don't think they would really interact with mortals that much. They would try to avoid it as much as humanly possible. The only interactions with mortals are to correct their mistakes. Yeah. Right? Like, I will visit this town full of sin yeah. and cleanse it. Right? I uh, fix. <laughs> I really like the idea of um, you are a uh, warlock and you are clearly like you've chosen Celestial Warlock. You've been raised in the church. You're not going cleric to the god. You're going warlock to the to the solar. Mm -hmm. um, and then what you don't realize is the fact that the church is actually evil and has captured the solar and is siphoning stuff like power to you. Oh. And all of your your commands coming down from the church go clean out this go deal with that it's all fine surface level but it's 
severely fucked up if you go digging. Yeah. yeah. And there's my there's my campaign long plot line for my celestial warlock okay. is the solar is like literally being bled. Yeah. For rituals to give you the power. Oh, creepy. Ew, uh, love mm. it. Love it. What pact? Uh, blade. Yeah. I, yeah. Honestly, all of these are blade. Celestial. It's all about, you know, coming down and showing God's wrath. Yeah. I think that you could make a decent, a decent argument for talisman, you know, cause you're getting essentially a holy symbol. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like you're channeling that you're blessing from your, your patron through this amulet that's hanging around your neck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's true. Is there a pact of the chain? Like, do we have a familiar? I mean, it's a holly font, I guess. A cherub. Yeah. Oh, a t- <laughs> yeah, like a, cherub. a like a chain smoking cherub. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Baby Herman from fucking yeah. Rear Framed Roger Rabbit. Fuck yeah! <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna talk about mummy lords and ladies, shall we say? <laughs> So, mummy lords and ladies are the monarchs or high priests or priestesses that are basically buried with the future intent that they can rise again and reclaim their rule. Um, so, they're buried with... They're buried? Buried? They're buried? They're buried with their regalia. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they're buried with their regalia. <laughs> as well as go through a heart transplant, basically, process of putting all their organs in, like... The little jars. jars. Yeah. Little jars. Um, think, you know, the, the mummy movie. Like, yeah. Yeah. I often do. Yeah. So, I mean... <laughs> Everyone in that movie was ridiculously good looking. 100%. I, like, I identify... Like, my sexual identification came from that movie. <laughs> Every single person I was attracted yeah. to. <laughs> hey, McConnell! <laughs> uh, but God bless Brendan Fraser. Yeah. <laughs> I'm loving his resurgence right now. Oh, me too. Mm, I am oh, so happy I'm about so it. so happy for him. Anyway, so... Um, mummy's body parts are put into Copic Dark... Canopic jars, and then um, they basically are buried like that, and they're thought to come back. So very much like a lich, though, um, if they are killed, they will respawn next to their jars, but within 24 hours. No dice roll for this one. This just a day later they are respawned. Sure. And mm-hmm. poofed back into existence, basically. Um, and then the heart can only be destroyed by fire. Like, their heart that is removed is the only thing that can kill them, and it can only be killed by fire. Neat. So yeah. it's immune to everything except for lighting that shit up. This is like a diet phylactery. Yeah. Basically, yeah. So I would almost say it's better. You come back in twenty four hours instead of one D ten days. Yeah, but the phylactery, I mean, there've got to be rituals and shit. You have to you have to sacrifice forty virgins and then toss a phylactery to a volcano for uh-huh. that to work instead of just like, hey, look, I have a tinder box. Let's do this. Yeah. But, like, I also feel like becoming a mummy lord or a lady would, it would bode that you would have a lot of trust in your followers to begin with. Because, like, if you wanted to become a mummy lord, they would have to go through the ritual after you have died. Yeah. So. Is the female version of a mummy lord a daddy lady? Daddy lady. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember. What was Cleopatra? What was her title? Wasn't she an Paris? empress? It was an empress? I don't know, man. Because I know there's pharaohs. Pharaohs? Fair- I, don't, that I don't know if they had... Unisex? Well, I don't know if it was very... I'm not sure. That, like, like Queen Elizabeth never got king. Right? Like, she yeah. had the, the yeah. other... Uh, I'm looking it up. Yeah, you can look that up. Um, but yeah, while you're looking that up. So, they, similar to, like, a phylactery, of course, they're going to want to keep their heart jar safe. Mm-hmm. So, usually it'll be hidden somewhere, uh, like, in a tomb or a lair. Um, which if a mummy lord is within their tomb slash lair, they are technically only a CR of 16. So a little bit, a little bit softer than the other ones I've spoken about so far. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. A female pharaoh is just called a pharaoh. Okay. But a princess is actually just referred to as king's daughter. Yeah. So not until they are ruling do they become pharaoh. So pharaoh's gender neutral. Yeah. All right. There you go. Love that. Ahead of their time. Um, but yeah. So how does the mummy lord operate? Um, they're basically a standalone, they are a medium, undead, lawful, evil being that on their own is a CR of 15. They have terrible strength, but also a solid wisdom, con, and charisma. Um, they are, of course, spellcasters. Some of the spells they get are, they make sense, but not all of them. What do you um, mean? So, like, their cantrips are sacred flame and thaumaturgy, which I think fits, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, they have command, things like guiding bolts, they get silence, they get hold person, 
um, animate dead fits. Um, um, but then they get, like, divination and things like that. The ones that I find are, like, they fit because it's a mummy lord, which is, like, contagion, insect, <laughs> and insect plague. Yeah. And then yeah, harm, yeah, yeah. which yeah. I feel like... If we're going the mummy movie train, like hundred percent, like yeah, that, oh, yeah. That tracks. Well, divination is is uh, the spell just lets you see beyond yeah. your immediate surroundings, right? Like, mm. you know how in the mummy, there he's almost all knowing. Like he sees the plane over there, and he's like, "All right, fuck it, I know who's on that plane." Yeah, I'm gonna fuck with that plane. Now. And the fact that he's not even afraid of the plane, you know yeah. what I mean? Like you were like, you're five hundred million years old, and you see a fucking flying metal object in the sky, and you're like, "Yeah, fuck that, I'll eat it." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I feel like choosing Mummy Lord as a patron is an interesting one. I feel it would be because they are deeply locked into this history. Like, imagine your player knew of this royalty and their, their power and their prowess. They seek them out to, like, be a part of their patronage and, like, help them rebuild and reclaim their, their rule. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. And then, like, this mummy is now, like, also building an army of patrons to help rebuild its mm -hmm. existence, okay. right? So, and this is what I was kind of speaking to before, where... They're a lower CR. They're only a CR sixteen. So you're they you're, they will eventually surpass them one hundred percent. But because of their like monarchdom, like it's what keeps them in in power, right? Like I don't think that they technically need to continuously raise their power level along with your patrons. I feel like they worship them for the fact that they are great leaders, yeah, or were once a great leader, yeah. So that's how I feel anyway. But I would choose Pact of the Blade. Um, as I can see, like, with a mummy lord wanting protection and with their ability to, like, they have the ability to blind, um, with dust and stun people with a blasphemous word is the thing that they can do. Um, and this gives your follow the ability to kind of step in and be a warrior for them kind of thing. So that's how I feel. I like the idea that this, the power that they're getting from this patron is not from the patron itself, but in the same vein as how the patron got their power. Yeah. Like, rituals were done to make them a mummy lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? I'm going to follow them because they're my king. I will do similar rituals to gain powers so I can be the best warrior for my king. Yeah. 100%. So, that's pretty much all there is to them. They're pretty simple. They're not too complicated. What's Pact? Um, I said Pact of Blade, so they can be warriors for them. Yeah. I can see Talisman being good for this one, too. Yeah. Yeah. The, the onk on the, on the necklace. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Well, and there's enough spells you could do Pact of the Tome, too, thematically. There's... Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Throw in some extra cantrips in there. 100%. Cool. I love yeah. that. They're very cute. Um, so, for the Fathomless, I have spoken about a monstrosity and a dragon, so let's talk about giants. Uh, there is a Storm Giant Quintessent. Uh, this is from the multi uh, Monsters of the Multiverse uh, and from Volos before that. Um, the... Storm Giant Quintessent is a huge giant, um, kind of. It's more complicated than that. Uh, they are storm giants. They are huge. Uh, however, as they near the end of their life, they decide that they are going to become storms, and they do that. Mm -hmm. And they are just a storm most of the time. They can solidify again to become a giant for short periods of time, but in order to, to continue to have influence upon the world, they live as living storms mm -hmm. uh, with intelligence. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, these guys are CR thirteen, but uh, well, storm giants are CR thirteen. Quintessents are CR sixteen um, because they're essentially the epitome of what storm giants are all about. I looked it up. Quintessent is not a word, but quintessence is, and it means the most perfect or typical example of a quality or class, which makes sense for storm giants. Yeah. Yeah. At sea, when you are a storm giant and you become a storm, you uh, get to be a squall or a tidal surge, a typhoon, tidal waves, water spouts, and tsunamis. On land, you can be a cyclone or a blizzard or a thunderstorm, a tornado, a sandstorm even. It doesn't have to be water necessarily. Yeah. But it definitely would be for the fathomless um, warlock patron. Yeah. Um, these storm giant quintessence can very uh, briefly coalesce into their original forms. Uh, from time to time, but they prefer to stay in their undying storm essence because they're at the end of their natural life. If they are in giant form, they continue to age and die out. Yeah. If they're a storm, they're essentially immortal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they've got a pretty underwhelming AC. and We don't get their storm statistics, just their giant statistics, because how do you fight a cloud? Yeah. Their AC kind of sucks, uh, but they have huge hit points for their level. Um, and they've got immunities to lightning and thunder, which makes sense. All of their attacks, layer actions, and original effects are based on wind, fog, 
rain, lightning, and thunder. They don't specifically have access to any spells except their one with the storm legendary action, which lets them essentially cast control weather. But if we look at what the standard storm giant can do, we can figure out other spells that they're at least thematically connected to. Along with control weather, they get feather fall, water breathing, levitate, light, and detect magic. I think all of that is tangentially okay for a fathomless. I'm not sure. I mean, levitate seems like a weird one. Storms. So, like, just yeah. well, Loading. well, you have gust on your on your spell list as a fathomless warlock. Yeah. So, the, yeah, there's a certain amount of like flying, like storm, like the X Men storm. Yeah. Right. So, I, sure, I get it. Um, I would flavor it so that your cape is billowing and your hair is flying around and if you're levitating. So. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so how do you use one as a patron? Well, storm giants are obsessed with one thing only, and that's the return of their god. Omens, prophecies, portents, and mystical signals all give them insights about the return of their all-father, Adam. He has abandoned giant kind, and the storm giants at the apex of the ordning are left as reluctant stewards that would love to give the job back. Uh, this is uh, your plot hook right there. So, a storm giant learns about the steps that has to be taken to usher in Anam's return, but was too old to do anything about it. So, she became a quintessent and has reached out to the last person the other giants would expect, one of the small folk. Yeah. Now, this unassuming herald gets visions of eyes in the clouds, sees a massive face towering over them in puddles, uh, hears voices in the thunder, feels the wind and rain gently guiding her, Toward her destiny, so she is being pushed towards bringing Adam back. Yeah. Uh, this spell list uh, for the Fathomless Warlock is pretty solid thematically. Uh, I just revert Bigby's hand back to being Bigby's hand, except it's clearly a purple hand of a storm giant. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when the Warlock gets powerful enough to be able to surpass the Quintessent in power, I would have a really cool cutscene or set piece encounter where, in the eye of a tropical cyclone, the storm giant manifests. Thanks the warlock, and then infuses the warlock with her life essence, merging bodies, and then is gone. Yeah. So you can still power up, you still unlock the power, but you have now passed CR 16 or whatever it is. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so you absorb the storm giant. I would say, I would think that's a really cool... And then you essentially would act as storm from X-Men. Yeah. Right? Like, it is the power inside you. You might even be able to, like, share consciousness. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. And then I would have something as simple as a uh, a little conch shell or something. Um, I wanted Pack to the Talisman, and I wanted to be able to listen to the conch shell to hear your patron's voice. Ooh. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it's like, all I'm getting today is ocean. <laughs> ocean <laughs> sounds. <laughs> and it rings, too. <laughs> yeah, but, it's, but it's the sound of a seagull. Yeah. It's right? <laughs> actually just a pager, to be yeah. honest with you. It starts flashing Roman numerals or something on yeah, it. Hold on, I've got to do a ritual. Yeah, excuse me, be right back. Um, do you guys like this as a warlock patron? I I do. I love giants in general. Um, storm giants were one of my favorite ones, and yeah. now I wish we that was on our giants episode because that was a dope plot. <laughs> yeah. Hook. yeah, I really like them. I think I think this is fun. It's really hard to find fathomless patrons that aren't krakens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, because again, everything aquatic is low level. So yeah, it's true. Right, it's like trying to find celestials that aren't angels. Yeah, it's all low level or angels, mm-hmm. except for an Empyrean, right? So and unicorns. Unicorns are low level. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Murder a unicorn. <laughs> Take its horn and stick it to your forehead. Are we looking for a unicorn horn in our game at some point? You were looking for a unicorn horn, yeah. and uh, you gave up on that. Yeah. And moved along. Other things. I remember reading it in my notes the other day, and I was like, oh. I'm supposed to do that, I was right? Supposed to get a unicorn horn. <laughs> That would have given you guys one uh, one opportunity to cast Revivify. Well, shit. Whoops. Anyways, uh. moving on. <laughs> For another day. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about Planetars next. Uh, they serve basically as the fists of God, right? They, uh, yep. They, yep. They, uh, that was my nickname in college. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Uh, they are sent to help mortals on holy quests, and then also just to act out a deity's divine will on the mortal plane. So if their followers are um, dealing with a drought, they'll send them along to give them rain or, you know, battle something that's attacking one of the settlements. But they also just love battling fiends, Mm. and they are all over any quest that has to do with that. And they will love to help mortals in those kinds of things as well. Yeah. 
How do they feel about tieflings? Um, I know it doesn't get into that in the lore, but I would assume that that they're not wild about tieflings. Not wild about them, but I think it would depend on the tiefling. Right? Yeah. Well, it depends on the nature. Uh, so they get 40 feet of walking, uh, 120 feet of flying. They're resistant to radiant damage and non-magical attacks. Uh, immunity to being charmed, frightened, or exhausted. Uh, 120 feet of true sight and telepathy. But they also, like the other Celestials, speak all languages. Mm-hmm. Um, they have angelic weapons, so it means they deal 5d8 radiant damage on a hit. Uh, they have divine awareness, like Solars, so they can always hear a lie. Um, they have innate spellcasting, which is mostly has to do with good and evil and controlling weather and resurrection. So I think these line up probably the best with the class. Yeah. They have a CR of 16, so pretty low. Yeah. Um, but this is a great one for being able to rank up with the players, right? Because Plantars turn into Solar. So if you complete a certain amount of quests, then they can move up in the deity chain as well. Yeah, it's almost like you want to bolster them so that they can get to the next level so you can get more power from them. Yeah. Yeah. So... I just want to point out really quickly, I would say that there are really three forms of communication that they don't speak, as much as it says all Celestials can speak all languages. Mm. They're not going to know Thieves can't. Yeah. Um, they're not going to know Druidic. Yeah. Uh, and there is something from previous editions that doesn't exist in 5th edition, I think it's name dropped once in one of the modules, is Dark Speech, which is different than, we have Deep Speech for um, the Aberrations. Dark speech is the secret evil language of evil gods that even devils and demons won't speak mm. because they are afraid that it will summon the most evil, darkest creatures in existence. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So I don't think that even angels would know dark speech because this was developed by evil gods to communicate among themselves. Yeah. Like free of good. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. So I would say that. I'm not sure that will ever come up in a campaign, but it, it always bothers me when it says all languages. I wish I would just list out which ones they do know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so why they would help you? I mean, they were sent. Seems like the most obvious one, right? They like to help mortals along with quests. So they were sent and they're like, okay, well, let me help you out with this. What's going on? Uh, you're battling fiends, obviously, is going to be a big draw for them. Um or they just take pity on you because you're so bad at fighting. They're like... <laughs> when, when you have flirted with the TPK over and over and over again. Yeah. They're like, oh, sweetheart. I mean, you're going to need this. Sweet summer, ain't you? Yeah. You're trying your best. Yeah. At hill. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I forgot about this one reason for Solar, which I thought was kind of funny. So um, a reason they, they would contact you and get you to do things and make you become a warlock is... For you to make certain things happen to ensure a prophecy comes true, right? So you're going around getting all this background stuff done that is like leading up to a prophecy. Mm-hmm. Or they could, one of them could come up to you and be like, here, here's a sword. Now, I need you to give it to a dude named Arthur. But the catch is I need you to lay at the bottom of the lake and pretend you're a forest sprite. <laughs> <laughs> the catch here yeah. is... <laughs> And you're like, all right. Here, here's yeah. a bikini top. Yeah. Off you go. <laughs> I can do that. This. I will do that. Yeah, absolutely. He'll know what it means. Yeah. <laughs> I love it too. You just like give up and stick it in a sword in a stone. Yeah. And just walk the fuck away. <laughs> Ta-da! The was like, yes! <laughs> we done did it. I love the idea too of he's like, the prophecy will come into fruition when the stars align, and you guys are my stars. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Gross. <laughs> That's way too feel good for me. The solar angel is just like a like a little old lady. She's just a, a mother. Aw, I'm making yeah. cookies and shit. Yeah. <laughs> you like a cookie? Yeah, the feeling good is just, it's too much for me for this whole celestial warlock kind of thing. Warlocks are flavored to be evil like that's hard baked right into them yeah they don't have to be and i think we say that in every warlock episode is you don't have to go evil no. mm. um but you've got to do some mental gymnastics for celestials with yeah these guys, it's right? so weird because like why wouldn't you just be a cleric right yeah it makes way more sense for them to have clerics than warlocks <sighs> yep I feel like you have to have plot reasons to do it. Mm-hmm. This is my problem with everything celestial in the first place is we have ASMRs, we've got celestial sorcerers, we've got celestial um, 
I don't. I think I got that wrong. What's the What's the celestial sorcerer? I uh, forget, divine I forget, soul. Divine soul sorcerer, yeah. right? So there are warlocks. There are, um, of course, every kind of cleric could be right. Yeah, paladins uh, are pretty much. Yeah, right. You have so many forces for the like the heavens. Yeah. <sighs> It is almost like pick your pick your flavor, mm. and sure, more options are good for people, and you can pick and choose what you want. But yeah. it kind of makes your cleric not feel special. Yeah. Although I do like the idea of having a cleric and a divine soul sorcerer, and a, like, and you line them all up to all be on one big fucking team, and mm. they are like, we're the forces of good with the same god. Yeah, like mm. the A team even assembled from all these different like walks of life. It's th- I, I'm stealing this from the internet, but we would call it the Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. I hate it. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it for what pack like, blade. I mean, they are they're, they're all blade. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. To your point, they're all like warriors of yeah, their gods, good, or whatever. Right? Coming down to fight fiends and protect yeah. the innocent. Yeah, I, these ones seem real simple and to the point, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's talk about vampires. Yay. Talking about angels. I like how like the, the juxtaposition between you and I is really yeah. like, um, So I chose Vampire 2, Vampires last because I love vampires. I don't know if you know this about my goth self, but absolutely. No, get out of here. <laughs> it's so strange. I thought that Twilight talk at the beginning of this episode was just, you know. Hey, man. Yeah. I, was a one time o- I was the target audience when that <laughs> book came out. I'll tell you that right now. Um but anyways, um, they are in D&D as well as they are in pop culture, blood-sucking immortals who hate the sunlight. Very simple. Uh, they seek what they wanted most in their living life. So if they were lovers, they tend to seek partners. If they um, loved having family, they seek children um, to basically just help them live forever and live their eternal life of whatever makes them happy. Yeah. Um, but that also makes them very selfish and very self-centered and... I feel like they need therapy. You are absolutely not wrong. I mean, but most of these guys need therapy, to be honest. Yeah. I think you need a little bit of self-awareness to, for therapy to actually work, though. <laughs> <laughs> we talked a little bit earlier, there's vampire spawn, basically. Yep. So, yes, they have. They can make vampire spawn. They can turn other people into vampires. Um, basically, once that happens, they become akin to them. Unless they drink the blood of the master, and then they actually become a true vampire themselves, and they are no longer under control. Kind of like the Dobby gets a sock kind of thing. Mm. So that's that. Wasn't that in? I've seen that before in other media. I'm trying to remember what it was. I'm trying to remember, like, because I'm trying to think of other like vampire. Because everybody's vampire like lordom is different, yeah. and how they operate, how they change, how they shift. Okay, Buffy's the one I'm most familiar with. Where if they just drink your blood, you die. But if and this, I think this has become popular. If they drink your blood and then you drink theirs, Their blood, you become a vampire. That's how yeah. you are turned. Yeah. Whereas this is saying no, they just turn you by turning you. Yeah, they choose and to. They yeah. choose to yeah. turn you. And then you are now akin to them and you are basically a slave to them until you actually get a boon of having the blood of your master. Or just taking it yourself. You know what I mean? Um, they also become true vampires after their master dies. So if their master dies, then they their the spawn will become its own true thing. Sure. I can imagine like being a vampire and like you're akin to this, then all of a sudden they die and you're like... <gasps> <laughs> I am a true vampire now. <laughs> this is the middle of the forest somewhere. Like, <laughs> can you imagine at the end of Curse of Strahd, you kill Strahd, and then you can see like six vampire spawn like wake up, and be like, oh, 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 god, yay! Yeah. And then he's like run off into the mist. You're like, oh, oh fuck, <laughs> shit. What have we done? Probably should have taken care of that first. <laughs> Um, that is the exact opposite of the standard vampire lore, where you kill the master and everything down when, like, you kill the sire, and everything that they've done, and, like, through generations of vampires, yeah. mm-hmm. all turn to dust immediately, right? Yeah. yeah. That's standard, like the, um... It's like kill the bloodline kind of thing. Yeah, in yeah. my head, it's the Independence Day, you kill the mothership and all the other little ones die off, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's... Like, poof. You see that a lot in science fiction. You see that a lot in in vampire lore. Yeah, but I like that D and D is different. Like you got to kill all the vampire spawn first. Yeah, and then yeah, and then you don't have to worry about them being their own true selves, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, vampires are bound to their burial sites and must lay to rest during the day to kind of regen themselves. Um, they can change the location by moving their coffin. Like it's very like D and D lore is very common. They have a coffin. They have a casket. They and they yep. move it around, and that's their safe space, right? Yeah. Well, it has to be where their transformation took place. So if you kill them and then you bury them, then that's when their transformation takes place. 
right? And yeah. th so they have to keep that. So if you just like, if one of them was killed by the side of the road and then just buried underground, they need to take that dirt that they were buried under yes. where they transformed. Yeah. The dirt is very important. Yeah. It's very, like, <laughs> this is my dirt. Mommy. Um, Love me a good dirty vampire. Oh, baby. Well, vampires are generally surpassable by their patron as they're only a CR 13 on their own. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, this is another one where I feel like you was, yes, the patron would end up getting stronger than this vampire, but like. Oh, you mean the warlock? Sorry, the warlock, yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the, the warlock would be able to surpass the vampire at some point, um, but I feel like they would not want to kill them or not be able to because of how many spawn or other warriors this vampire would have created for itself, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they are weak in strength, but of course they are super intelligent, wise, and charismatic, along with being perceptive and stealthy. They are also considered to be shape changers. Um, as to escape sunlight, they can polymorph into a bat or a mist to escape the deadly UV rays, or a battle they just don't want to be in anymore. Is it just those? What? See, I always go Dracula lore too, where they can be a wolf. Oh man, right? like, I feel like you they, can they flavor can, it however you want. They can be a swarm of, of centipedes if they want. Yeah, like, man. Yeah. Just become like a, yeah, a swarm of bugs. <laughs> Peace out. I kind of like that visual idea, right? Like they're just a person, and then all of a sudden just a pile of centipedes that falls apart and spreads out. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I like the idea of the Pact of the Talisman for these folks, as I get the feeling that most vampires have a sense of arrogance to them. Again, they're self-centered, and they have, like, a sense of, I am the best at everything, so I feel like passing ability checks and doing those things are very important to them. Yeah. So they would want to bolster their patrons. Yeah. Um, but, like, to be fair, like, I, I just try to struggle to figure out why someone would want a vampire as their as, like, their patron. Like, it, it's, there's a couple of, like, again, there's a couple of different ways you can go about it, but it's one of those things where I find vampirism to be super annoying. Like, you, you don't, can't go out in the sun, you're constantly weakened, like, and don't get me wrong, they're strong and they live forever because they'll just regenerate in their coffin or whatever mm. if they die, or they just turn into the pink mist and they fly away if they die. And, like, yeah. they're hard to kill. But, like, how fucking annoying would it be to die so many fucking times because you come across very strong teens all the time or if you're just by yourself. And Well, you have to keep in mind, too, that these guys are hunters. Yeah. And that's built into their lore where it's not... D&D &D vampires, strawed aside, are not romanticized. No. They are vicious. They're, they hunt. They're going to pick you off one at a time because even if you are level 20, this is CR 13, which means they're the equivalent of a party, a 13th level party, yeah. which means... They're going to fuck with you, and they're dropping your maximum hit points as they, you know, eat you. And you can attack them, but they're going to regenerate. And, like, you may not win this even at level 20. Yeah. And that's the thing about them. So they're going to be smart. If I'm going to play a vampire, I'm going to play the the predator that is following the party. Okay. Um, and that's going to make them far more formidable than their, their stat block looks. Jeff has got a big fucking opinion about how vampires are completely underleveled. Mm -hmm. um, are under CR'd uh, because the CR only reflects their stat block and not the lore or strategy that's given to them. The intelligence mm -hmm. that they have and yeah. how they utilize their abilities. And yeah. that that's the way that I feel about anything that's, you know, about CR 12 and up. If mm -hmm. they've got intelligence at all and they're that powerful, they know how to fucking use it, right? Yeah, they'll figure it out, right? So, um, I like the idea of these guys being um, packed with the familiar, a warlock, so that you can have a little Guillermo following A little, 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 little bat yeah. or something? No, a little Guillermo. I don't know what a Guillermo is. You don't know what a Guillermo is? No, what's that? <laughs> Did you not watch uh, What We Do in the Shadows? No. Oh, really? No. Megan. I'm sorry. I haven't watched it either. Jesus, <laughs> I figured you two were the two to watch it. No. It is 100% your jam. Both okay. of you. You would Good fucking love it. Good to know. Really? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, fam. But I just want a little bat or something. Yeah. Bat buddies. <laughs> is it like an imp? Hmm? What is, what is this Guillermo? Uh, Guillermo is um, a little fat Hispanic man. Okay. That is that is a vampire that's familiar. <laughs> yeah. Who is promised at some point, and here's your plot hook, I've been promised that I will be turned into a vampire someday. Yeah. Okay, well, there you go, yeah. I get my immortal life. I just have to suffer through this bullshit. Yeah, it vampire. would be like someone seeking an immortal life. Yeah. And this would be the easiest, fastest way to get it. Yeah. Yeah. I like Pack of the Talisman, too, because I'm thinking uh, Blade, you know, where they have the familiars and they're marked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, they're, like, tattooed to say that you are a familiar. Oh, so yeah, it's yeah. like that. You're carrying the vampire's mark kind of thing. Oh, what a uh, callback to that uh, movie. I'm going to watch that. 
I, I actually just watch, did. I want to watch yeah. Blade Trinity just because Ryan Reynolds is in it. Yeah. He, he carried that fucking movie. Of course he did. Blade One actually held up very well. Very surprised for like a ninety. It was nineteen ninety eight. Yeah. Yeah. That's still pretty fucking good. I'm glad they're gonna remake it. Mm-hmm. We'll see how it goes. I trusted it. Um, okay, so that brings me to my last one, um, which is the Leviathan. Leviathans, uh, so I'm, I'm running the gamut of different creature types. Um, Leviathans are elementals now. Um, these guys are gargantuan, and they kind of have a serpentine dragon body to them. Um, and they are just water elementals. They're literally forces of nature. Yeah. Um, they tend to hide in uh, large bodies of water, uh, and they can come up onto land where they move more slowly. But they fuck your shit up. They're essentially a siege monster. Yeah. They are as big as they come. These things will blot out the sun uh, if they get above you. Uh, while their alignment is typically neutral, the themes of the Leviathan are chaos and destruction. This is literally a storm that wants to storm. Mm-hmm. The word apocalyptic is thrown about in its lore a lot. Yeah. Their CR-20, with all the hit points and attacks to back it up, no languages, only emotion. Mm-hmm. Anyone who summons one must be incredibly powerful, nihilistic, and probably suicidal. Mm. These elder elementals don't want to be summoned, so if you do it, you've got to fucking deal with it. Mm. So Your fault. (laughs) Yeah. Good luck as a warlock of a leviathan. Surprisingly, its attacks and abilities seem to be acid-based, but I have a theory about this because I don't really have water damage. Uh, Much like the dragon turtle's uh, interesting but poorly explained steam attacks, the leviathan's flavor has to be seen through a particular lens. It isn't that the water is bubbling your skin away when it hits you. It's that the sheer force of the friction strips away your most outer layer, flaying and degloving you, leaving only raw meat and friction burns behind. And the closest thing we have in 5th edition for that is acid. Delicious. Okay. The attacks here um, are all water-based, so there's no lightning or thunder themes. Even cold is actually a weakness and not a feature, because you can freeze parts of it and it hurts it. Mm -hmm. Um, The creature is... Simple, and not even really sentient, with an intelligence modifier of negative four. There are only three words that you need to know. And these words, when combined, will terrify the average person, but for the warlock, this is everything they want. Water, power, destruction. Mm -hmm. In this kind of situation, I don't think that there's much of a relationship between the warlock and Leviathan, and any communication is done through sheer force of will. A fathomless warlock who has tapped into a Leviathan's powers is merely leeching that power off of them. There's no deal. There's not really a pact. This isn't symbiotic by any means. This is an arcane parasite who has discovered a way to harness some of the power of a raging storm serpent that's hellbent on destruction. Yeah, I can see that. Mm-hmm. So, um, I had trouble coming up with what's the uh, what's the role playing that you get out of this, and I think the answer there is rage. Yeah. You are just consistently raging all of the time. Yeah. Pack to the blade for this guy as well. Fight, fight, fight. Yeah. 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 you, you got to let the hatred flow. Always exhibiting some of the Leviathan's powers, uh, either through willpower or emotion or supernatural control over the elements. Mm. Bigby's hand is just dense water. Sleet Storm is now a torrential downpour, moving so quickly that your large raindrops are bludgeoning you, as if a hurricane focused its malevolence at you. Summon Elemental always summons water elementals that look like small versions of the Leviathan. The omens that you have are of ships being destroyed and coastal villages being swept out to sea. As you grow in power, you begin uh, you begin to leave damp footprints behind you when you walk. You're always leaking tears out of your eyes. Eventually, your touch remains wet and your breath becomes raspy. This one is squelching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A mere mortal was never meant to harness the elements like this. I also imagine, like, crazy hair. Like, just yeah. sticking up every which way. Yeah. Um, I figured that at around level 19, the warlock begins to give off some of the same vibes as the storm. People's hair stand on end when they enter a room. The sky always darkens above them. It never stops raining. And they are becoming the storm. And the Leviathan can sense their location now. Yeah. Think about a tidal wave rushing across a landscape, hunting for the creature who's been weakening it for the past few months. And that's oh. an incoming battle for the end of your campaign. Yeah, I'm going to get you. Yeah. I think the final session of level 20 campaign is to be the showdown between the Warlock and the party versus the Leviathan. And when the players win, there should be a brief victory celebration before the Warlock suddenly explodes into a massive orb of water hovering above the ground, lightning sparking inside, and arcing out dangerously. And then you hand the player the Leviathan stat block, 
and tell them they have absorbed the creature's energy and have now ascended to become the first elder elemental with an actual sentience. Oh. And now you have a big bad for the next campaign. Yep, yeah. there's your new... Yep. Oh, okay. I love it when players become the evil person. Yeah. It's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> So the last one I have is Death Pact Angel, which is from Ravnica. Uh, Death Pact Angels are the result of angels being seduced by greed and the lust for power, forsaking their oaths to join the Orzov Syndicate, which is a criminal cabal of loan sharks led by the ghosts of its most deceitful and ruthless members, uh, which masquerades as a religious organization that preaches wealth is power and that to follow the Orzov Syndicate is to achieve wealth. Death... <laughs> Just we're just gonna need you to give us uh, 1999 every month. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pyramid scheme. Yes. Yeah. There's multi levels to this marketing. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's not a pyramid scheme. No. It is clearly a pyramid. Yeah. There's a triangle involved. No, it's upside down. It funnels down uh, to the one guy, right? So. Yeah. Uh, Deathback angels serve as debt collectors, executioners, power brokers, or just kind of do their own thing within the organization. Um, they love to collect riches and thralls by granting selfish wishes for wealth, power, or prestige to petitioners in exchange for their soul's eternal devotion. Um, while they believe themselves to be benevolent, they only do stuff for themselves first, right? And will only do it if they get something in return. Hey, we're all equal. I'm just more equal, so yeah. it's all I'm, good. I'm yeah. extra equal than you are. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to give you all this wealth. I just need you to sign this contract this with your yeah. blood. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. So the spells don't really match up at all for this. Yeah. If you wanted to go Death Pact Angel, you were going to have to reflavor it with necrotic spells and charm spells. Yeah. Because that's what they really do. The weakness of this is it's not really in... The vein of the subclass, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing, because no, you can you, you can mix it up, make it a little bit different, yeah. right? Yeah, throw in an evil kind of mm, judge to it. Um, I feel like every time you cast a spell, you can hear gold clinking. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like gold to like the coin purse. Yeah, yeah. oh, I like that. Uh, it's, uh, the one thing I do like about these guys is it's pretty much tailor made for an eventual showdown between your warlock. And this Death Pact Angel. Because yeah. eventually this Death Pact Angel is going to want to come for your soul. Right? Like when you're close to death, that's when they're coming for you. Yeah. So here's money now and I get to reap your soul later. Is that what this is? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. And say so your soul owes me eternal devotion once you're dead. Right? Like once you no longer have use for all this wealth, then you come to me. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like making a deal with the devil. Yeah. Yeah, this feels almost fiendish, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, Less angelic, more fiendy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, they have a pretty low CR of only 14, but they do have some pretty cool abilities. Uh, so they can walk 30 feet, fly 90 feet. Uh, they're resistant to necrotic and radiant damage and non-magical attacks as well. Immune to being charmed, frightened, or exhausted. Uh, they have true sight, like all other, all other celestials, out to 120 feet. Uh, so for abilities, they have exploitation of the debtors, where as a bonus action, they can... Uh, target a creature that has been charmed by them within 30 feet and deal 2d10 necrotic damage to the target and then gain temporary hit points equal to the damage done. That's pretty cool. Yeah. They also have fly by, so... They don't have the opportunity to attack, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Words just... <laughs> I was doing great! And then all of a sudden... We're almost there. The we got you. We're yeah. good. Yeah. Can't <laughs> sentence properly. <laughs> Uh, they have magical resistance, so they have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. Uh, they have a multi-attack, so they can make either two scythe attacks, or they can make one scythe attack and one chains of obligation attack. Uh, so the scythe attack, uh, it's kind of like the angelic weapons where it deals necrotic damage instead of radiant this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then chains of obligation uh, targets one creature that's charmed by them within 90 feet, uh, and then if they fail... That target is paralyzed for one minute. I feel like you're going to multi-class it from a rogue into this. Mm. Yeah, I can right? see that. Like you're like a thief rogue mm-hmm. into this. Sneaky, sneaky. And fallen Asimar again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That would be a good one. Um, so why would they want to interact with mortals? Well, I think eventually they would want to claim your soul, right? Yeah. Like it's always tit for tat kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine starting the campaign with hey? Guys, I know you're level one. I will give you 10,000 gold pieces now. Yeah. 
and you get some power. No. Just sign this. <laughs> Become a part of my pyramid scheme. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's got a pumpkin spice latte in the other hand. (laughs) (laughs) No. No pumpkin spice lattes. Oh, man. Delightful. Uh, Another reason I can see them interacting with you and giving you power is basically they just need outside help to collect all their souls. Right? Like, you act as their repo man. Fair. As for importance or how they would get their message across to you, like... I know this is a tough one because taking player agency away is a pretty big no-no in this game. But I mean, also that's exactly what this angel is flavored for. Right? Yeah. Like its spells are all charm and that's what it's going to do. So I think you're going to, you know, feel compelled, drawn, like something's tugging on your soul in the direction of where you need to go. It's like, um, it's pretty common in like possession movies and whatnot. That a hand will just start writing um, in like demonic script, yeah, or in Latin or something. Oh, okay, and yeah. I picture because it's all contract based, mm-hmm. right? As you are sitting there taking your your rest or whatever, you're you're sleeping. Your hand, independent of of you at all, reaches out, grabs a quill, and starts writing. Scribbling, yeah. Okay, yeah, I like that a lot. Cool. Which pact? Chain, maybe. I was going to say I would love to have a little familiar for them. Yeah. Yeah. It I can be like a little ghost. Yeah. I could see Pact to the Blade if you pull out a scythe. Yeah. Right? Um, I also, I'm thinking, you get Toll the Dead would be really good with this guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Only it makes sound of like a cash register. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of the bell. Yeah. It's just right? sound of like the coin flicking. Yeah. Like, to, like heads or tails. Ding. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this could be really flavorful and interesting. I want to use this in an evil campaign. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cuz this is very contract based. Yeah. yeah. And if I don't want to do fiend for that or fey, I would do this. Yeah, mm-hmm. it makes sense. So, now that we've kind of gone through a whole whopping 12 powerful fucking creatures that you can decide to have as a patron as a as a warlock, what would be your personal patron in D&D or what, in real life? Want to roll for? It? Yeah, sure. Like of the 12? Of the 12. I would say, I would say of the 12. Just keep it, uh, what is that 20 that you just rolled there? Uh, that would be a nat 20 that I just rolled. I did a 14. And you're going last with a 14. You're going last with a 14. Um, I'm trying to remember what everybody had. Um, I would... We did vampires, mummies, angels. Liches. Liches. N- Nightwalkers, Night giants, walkers. krakens, dragon turtles. Dragon turtles. I really want a little flying turtle. I do too. No, like, you said that. That, that's like, so like that's a big thing. I have geckos, and I love my geckos, so I would love yeah. to, like. I don't know. Honestly, um, I'm 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 all for powerful eternity. I'd be a lich. Yeah. 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 I can see. I can see you as Adam. Yeah. Going for lich stuff, to be <laughs> yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's that strive for knowledge and power. Mm-hmm. I understand. I understand. What about you, Kyle? Oh, in D and D, I would probably go Mummy Lord. Really? Yeah. I Random. really, I really like the Mummy Lord. I. I was thinking about um, what I would use for, like, signs and importance, too. Like, I imagine... Right, fuck, man. Stop (laughs) touching things, Kyle. That's how I communicate. (laughs) I communicate through touch. Yeah. (laughs) Anyways. Sensual rub. Wow. wow. (laughs) Uh, I really like the Mummy Lord. I, you know, I, I was imagining what they would do for signs and importance. And I imagine, like... You know, sand swirling up around your feet, no matter where you are, yeah. and it kind of leads you in the right direction. And also, I just think they're badass. It's true. Yeah, they yeah. want to go out and you know reconquer their empire, and it just sounds fun. You have no fucks. Yeah. Yeah. No, man, I would choose a kraken, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You're all about them tentacles. All about tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> all about just you know, love me a good sea life. Yeah, got some good sea legs. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Love to live the life of a pirate, you know, <laughs> just like worshiping a kraken. Mm-hmm. It'd be dope. Everybody'd be so scared of it, but you're like, nah, man, this is my, this is my butt. <laughs> this like, is just Joe. This is just, this is Kevin. Uh. Like, you met Kevin? <laughs> <Yeah>. like, <laughs> Y'all met Kev? Y'all met Kevin? <laughs> so, um, you know that when you look up, like, Mummy Lord in the Monster Manual, it is, you just get the picture of the mummy, which yeah. is like, Kind of rotted and bandages and whatnot. Mm-hmm. There's actually a mummy lord that is in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft called Onktopot. Oh, God. And 
the art is radically fucking different than what you would expect yeah. from Mommy. Like, it is Ooh. fucking golden gleaming like badassery. But then yeah. again, that's yeah. the whole thing where, like, the Mommy yeah. Lord especially is supposed to be very, like, buried with their riches. They're supposed yeah. to be, like, well-preserved, right? Yeah. So I yeah. feel like that fits a lot better. Yeah, they keep all their old armor and their magical weapons and stuff. So, yeah, yeah they're, they're going to be decked out. out in the regalia. Yeah. I think that makes sense to Yeah, me, right? I really like that. Like, it doesn't feel undead. It feels almost, like, otherworldly. Almost mm-hmm. celestial. Yeah, absolutely. So that's all for our discussion on Celestials, Fathomless, and Undead Warlock patrons. Make sure that you subscribe or follow and check back regularly to see what inspirations and insights we'll have for you in the future. And have a happy Halloween! Thanks for listening to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com, and a store with some It's a Mimic merch. This episode and others can also be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and most other podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. But it will squelch. So much squelching. This episode is called Warlock Patrons, who you want on your team for the Papa Lock Contest. <laughs> I was very proud of that one. Yeah. <laughs> In previous years, we've covered Great Old Ones, Arch Devils, and Demon Lords. Isn't that supposed to be my part? It's Kyle's part. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody. I am, I am so used to doing the whole fucking thing. Yeah. I like that we're changing up. All right, Kyle, mm-hmm. take us away. In previous years, we've covered Great Old um, sorry, my mouth was super dry. Oh, um, baby. <laughs> it wasn't squelching, that's for yeah. sure. It's not, not, not a squelch mouth. <laughs> Go on. Squelch mouth is like Smash Mouth cover band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. Thanks, Adam. I hate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> it's walking on the sunfish. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Hey man, I have to see my parents today. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, that sounds like my nightmare. Yeah. Seeing Megan's parents, I know. I know. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> you think I'm scary? You should see what made me. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye.